All right, can I get all my children to come up for their message this morning? 
Thank you, thank you, thank you. How are you? Good. Uh, we just crash landed. How are y'all this morning? All right. So who knows what this is? It's a ring. You know what kind of ring? A wedding ring? No. It's an engagement ring. Huh? Yeah. And what's in the middle of it? A diamond, right? So, huh? No, we're not destroying it. Are you crazy? We did, this is Miss Julie's engagement ring that I gave her 27 years, well, 28 years ago. 29 years ago? <laughs> I know I'm married 27, okay? That was, that was, the, that was the whole thing. All right, so how much you think it's worth? 10 Ten dollars? Ten whole dollars? What, a trillion? No. You think I had a trillion dollars to spend 29 years ago? Ten dollars? What you think? Oh, I hear you, a hundred. What else? A hundred dollars? Thirty dollars? Wow, they, they think I'm a cheap person. You know? I think you got like five hundred ninety. Well, it... I'm not going to tell you the actual value that I spent on it because that's not the right thing. Julie knows what I spent on it. it it's, 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 I, I, y'all, stop. All right. Thing is, basically, this is just a, a shiny rock, right? Well, that's what a diamond is. It's a shiny rock, but it's valuable. But we as people are the ones that put the value on it. Okay, stop for a minute. All right. And so they sell it in the store what they think it's worth. Now, I hope that my wife would say it's priceless because she wouldn't sell it for anything because it came from me in my heart when I proposed to her. So to her, it's, there's not enough money to buy it, I hope. <laughs> she grins, so I'm good on that one. The thing is, what I tell you is, this is basically just a rock. This is found in heaven all over the place. It's just a rock out of the ground that we put value on. But God thinks that you are the most valuable thing in the whole world. And that's why we celebrate Easter is that Jesus came for us because God so loved the world that he gave his only son so that we could be with him. It's about value. So yes, we just saying about is he worthy? He is because you are worthy of his love. And he did everything he could to have love from you and love you back and for you to love him back. Okay? All right? All right, somebody want to pray for us this morning? Nope, not me. All right, come on, Mabel. Pray for us this morning. God, thank you for everything that you did for us. Thank you for sending your son to die on the cross for us and freeing us from our sins. Amen. All right. Oh, candy. Oh, candy. All right, be careful. Just pick out one. It's suckers, buddy. Just grab a sucker. All right. Suckers. Suckers. Twizzlers. There you go. All right. Uh. Uh. Okay. okay, if you would open up your Bibles to John chapter 12. So we're going through the jo Gospel of John, and we've been, we've been going through our journey of John. And just kind of uh, recapping, as I always like to do. We like to do a quick recap of, of what we've been studying. And Jesus has just performed the greatest miracle that anybody had ever seen. And that was the calling forth of Lazarus, who was dead, out of the tomb. And he come walking out 
and everybody is in awe, and people are starting to truly believe that man, this man not only heals people, he heals the blind, the lame are walking, but he has now called a dead man that we know was dead back to life. And he walks out of the tomb what wrapped up in his cloths, and he says, unwrap him and set him free. And so everybody was starting to believe. People were questioning. We looked last week at what I titled, Why Would We Crucify Christ? And we kind of got to see an insight to the mindset of the Sanhedrin the other Gospels don't have. But the people ran to see the religious leaders to tell them about what Jesus just did, which, as I said last week, is not something that you know you can really fault them with. Some of them may say, oh, well, they were going to tattletale, but others... If they had something, that an, an event like this, and they had a full respect for the church and a full respect for their leaders, they're going to go to them and say, hey, is this legit? This man just called a man from the dead. He's got to be the Messiah, right? But instead, because of their own sinfulness and because of their afraid of their own power being lost and because they thought that, oh, well, you know, we know everything, their own pride got in the way and the Sanhedrin decided and rationalized for the better of the people, this guy's got to go. We've got to kill Jesus and the plot started. And so if you look with me real quick up in verses uh, chapter 11, 53 through 57, that's where we kind of touch base. They just had decided that they were going to kill Jesus. So at this day, so from that day, they planned together to kill him. Therefore, Jesus no longer continued to walk publicly amongst the Jews, but went away there to the region near the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there he stayed with the disciples. Now the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem from the country prior to the Passover in order to purify themselves. So they were looking for Jesus, saying to one another, as they stood in the temple area, What do you think, that he will not come to the feast at all? Now the chief priest and the Pharisees had given orders that if anyone knew where he was, he was to report it so that they might arrest him. So when the Sanhedrin plotted against Jesus, he knew his time <coughs> was about to come. So Jesus went back and he went to Ephraim and then later, as we see here, he goes back to Bethany to stay with Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. And the Apostle John records this next scene of a dinner where he is eating with Mary and Martha. And Martha. And we're going to see at this dinner the hearts of two individuals towards Christ. One, I'm going to say, was sold out to Jesus, and one is what I'm going to call was a sellout to Jesus. One being completely sold out, all in, they have committed themselves to Christ, and the other one is a sellout to Jesus and giving up and literally selling him out down the line. So number one, the sold out person, verses 1 through 3. Look with me there. Starting in chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. So they made him a dinner there, and Martha was serving, and Lazarus was the one of those reclining at the table with him, at the table. Alright, so we're going to stop there for a minute. So just the scenario we have, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He has come to life. He is now back at Lazarus' house. And just to kind of show that Lazarus is not some kind of ghost. He's not some kind of spirit. He is sitting in his home, reclining up against the table and eating dinner. I don't know of many ghosts that do that. I mean, you watch Ghostbusters if they try to eat something. They had Slimer in the movie that he ate something that went right through him, right? He can't digest it. So he's not a ghost. This is a real thing. Lazarus was back from the dead, and he was sitting there eating at the table with Christ. And then at the table, Mary comes in. And this is a person that is truly sold out for God. And let's look right here. It says in this one verse... There's a whole lot there that is written. 
Mary then took a pound of very expensive perfume of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house filled with the fragrance of perfume. In this short little verse that, that is recorded forever in the history, Mary shows a display of extravagant love for her Lord. She shows that she is sold out. The perfume that Mary bought, uh, brought to Jesus is an expensive in the eyes of everyone present. Everyone there. We have two people that actually make a remark. You've got John recording it, that it's a pound of expensive perfume. In a minute you'll see that Lazarus also states that it is an expensive perfume. It is said to be worth 300 denarii. Which is, to put into perspective, it's about a year of one salary. One year salary of the person of the time. The daily rate for an average pay of a worker was one denarii a day. You worked all day, you got one denarii. So if this is worth about 300 denarii, that's about a whole year's wage that she has spent on him. Everything that she saved up and purchased... Because we know from other scripture, these, this family was not rich. They were not rich. And so she comes in with this perfume, and this is not her leftovers. She has brought her best to him. She's offering everything. Her gift to Jesus was anointing his feet, was her way of yelling without saying a, a, a single word, You are worthy. Just as we sang, you are worthy of this. Of everything that I have to offer, you are worthy. She gave a testimony that morning or that night at dinner. He is worthy. He's a worthy of all that I have and all that I can muster. He wasn't expecting it. It was a ex display of great extravagant love for her Savior. He had done a lot for their family, and she was coming back to say, here I am, I love you. We as a society and as individuals, I think many times have forgotten how to show the true display of extravagant love. I think we have. We just do the very minimum. We don't give the whole sacrifice. We have lost the meaning of sacrifice to God. It's not just about giving your heart, coming up and, and saying a prayer. When you come up, you are surrendering yourself to the Lord God as your king. When you come to confess that you are a sinner before God and that you need God into your life, you kneel before God and submit your life to God. You surrender it all. We sing that, I surrender all. All to you, I give everything. And that is not that goes everything back to what we see when Jesus says, What does God ask of you? To love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, every part of your body. You know, I've preached on that. I've preached on it over and over again. That that we translate the word strength in English in Hebrew means and your everything, every ounce of you. Every drop of sweat of you, you should love the Lord your God with. Everything. And she was giving a great sacrifice. If something is worth anything in life, it requires sacrifice. Young people, we are losing that. If it is worth anything in life, it's worth sacrifice. Your marriage, your job, working, your Raising your children, it means sacrifice. That's what love is about. When people decide to have children, they're going to sacrifice a lot for that child. Time, money, love, right? I joke with all my time with my kids that Julie and I would be very, very wealthy monetarily if they weren't around. Taekwondo practice, you know, we did guitar lessons for a year. We, you know, everything to see them grow, feeding them, 
especially as teenagers. I got one now that eats a whole pizza. I'm like, where is it going? I thought Micah's bad. Now I've done called her out. But the point is, we are to sacrifice time, money, sleep, yourself. Mary's response to Jesus was a display of great sacrifice which showed you are worthy. You are worthy of everything I can muster up, Lord. I give this to you. Today, we can just kneel down in a physical feet of Jesus. We can't display the love like she did because he's not physically here with us. But we can give our hearts in worship to him, not coming into this building sourpuss, oh, they're not singing my favorite song today. Instead, letting the word, every song that we have has words that praise God. It may not be your genre, but it is one that is of worship. And your worship is of your attitude as if worth. I want the words that we are singing out of my mouth to glorify Him. Period. Whether it's old school or new school, we should be worshiping Him because that is all of worship, is giving our life and our words to Him. And so we sing and worship to Him. Our heart should be given. Our time to teaching and speaking the gospel should be what we are sacrificing to others. To serve in places in this church and to spread His love to other people. That is our act of worship. To show that He is worthy. He is worthy enough that I am going to show others how much Jesus loved me by telling them and living my life every day through our presence and time and service. That shows sacrifice that He is worthy of my time. He is worthy of my service. He is worthy. Our love can be expressed by expressing ourselves through acts of love to others. Others that may deem the act irrational, as we're going to see in a minute. Society would be like, as, as Judas responded here in a second, that her, her action was irrational towards Jesus. She sacrificed so much. That's too much for Jesus. And Jesus says, let her alone. That's what he says later. He says, leave her alone. She is doing a good thing. She humbled herself, not caring what others thought, which is something that we seem to let happen. She didn't care what anybody else in the room thought. She got down on her knees. She opened up the bottle, and she then began to worship by anointing him, showing him his worthiness to her in order to glorify him in the presence of others. She didn't care what others thought. She was going to show that he is her king and her Messiah. If you are a Christian, this is the heart that we should have. We should be so sold out for Christ that we are not ashamed of our faith in front of other people. We should not be ashamed to tell others about Christ. We should not be backing down when people pick on us because we refuse to live the worldly standard anymore. We want to live the Christian standard. We want to live a godly standard. We want to glorify God in the midst of everyone. That is why, you know, I, I tell you, I'm up here. Yes, I preach and I give each week. But I've told y'all, Jesus called people from multiple different works of life because he wanted the gospel to be spread to those different works of life. You are an evangelist for Jesus because you represent the light and darkness in your workplaces and in your home or at the ball field. Wherever it is, you represent Jesus Christ if you are a disciple of him. And we should be showing our love for him in the presence of others unashamedly. When we truly show our love for Jesus, it will impact the world. If not the world, the large realm of the world, it will impact the world that you live in. It will impact those that you are surrounded by. And you never know what your action, just as Mary did not know, she was coming to show a display of love and a display of worship to him, not knowing that she was anointing him for his future burial. 
that she was doing a good thing in anointing him and making him ready for what he was about to face. The second heart we see this morning is the sellout. So you have the one who's completely sold out. So now I'm going to show you the sellout of Jesus. So look with me in verse 4. It says, But Judas to carry it, one of the disciples, the one who intended to betray him, Jesus, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the proceeds given to poor people? Now he said this, not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as he kept the money box, he used to steal from what was put into it. So here you have the Apostle John showing a contrast between light and darkness. A person who is sold out for Jesus and one who's going to sell out Jesus. From genuine faith to pretending to believe, every church has people like this in it. They're there. They're present. They come to church all the time. You have unconditional faith. And then there's, Jesus, there's Judas. Judas started off as a seeker. He truly started off with genuine following Christ to find out about him. You can say he had good intentions, but that's where they stayed. They stayed at good intentions. We see that Judas never truly placed his faith in Jesus Christ. He apparently was wrapped up in greed. He could not let go of material things of this world. He walked with Jesus. He witnessed all the miracles of Jesus. He sat and ate with Jesus all the time for three years. And yet, he was not turned over in his heart. That's amazing. But that shows you. When you have something of a sin in your heart and you don't want to let it go, how you can even be in the present. This is what I told you that Jesus, when the Pharisees came to him asking to see a miracle, and he says, I tell you the truth, you can see one raised from the dead and you still would not believe. Just as the Sanhedrin. Folks, I, I've, I've told you, I've told you this, you know, when we talked at Easter, when we talked about Barabbas and we talked about Jesus. And I truly believe today if Jesus walked here that it doesn't matter what politician or which side that you go to, he would still be treated the same way because he would question their power. They would start to call him a bigot because he had a standard for sin. He would say he is unloving because he's not accepting their policies and procedure. They would, they would find any way that they could to hush him up. They would even make things up to probably try. They would accuse him just as they do today. There, you saw what Mary did as she anointed Christ at the feet and washed his hair or, or used her hair to wash his feet. There have been people who tried to suggest that Jesus was having an affair with her just to discredit him. There's nothing in here. Why wouldn't others? They had plenty of opportunity to stone him. He even tells them, as we looked in the crucified, for which, for which one of these sins are you about to stone me for? What are you going to stone me for? And their view back to him is that you claim to be God. Not that you're an adulterer, not that you're a liar, but that you claim to be God, and that's why we're going to stone you. That is what his whole trial, as we will see in a little bit, they didn't accuse him of anything else of other than proclaiming to be God, that he was blaspheming God's name. And they had the opportunity. But people will shout him down. People will come up with lies to try to say that. Judas started off with a seeker, but he had a sin in his life that he would not let go of. This shows that someone can be a part of the church, listen to the messages of the pastor, participate in messages, and never become sold out to Jesus, but be a sellout. And that is scary. When people say, and, I, and I'm kind of ripping this off from a guy, I don't know his name, I saw a video, but it was really kind of impactful. He goes, when people say, I used to be a Christian, he said, or I tried church, he says, that tells me you were never sold out to Christ. 
That means you made an appearance in a building with people. He said, because a Christian is one who has knelt at the feet of Jesus, has humbled themselves before him, says, I am a sinner, God. I am not worthy of heaven. Lord, help me. Save me. I can't do it on my own, Lord. I surrender my life to you, and I will follow you wherever you go, Lord. That is a Christian, sold out for God, kneeling down, washing his feet. That is a Christian. He said, for those who try to proclaim that they used to be a Christian would be like saying, I was happily married for 10 years, had three wonderful children until I discovered my wife didn't exist. Think about it. To say you're a Christian means that you believe God exists and you know He exists and you surrendered your life and you live your life for Him. To say I used to be means... I had all these wonderful things in my life and everything was happening and then I decided, well, my wife doesn't exist anymore. She's not here. I don't see you. So to be sold out means you've given your life over. To be a genuine believer, you have surrendered to Christ. Your life has changed. Jesus, you, you've seen Jesus change other people's lives. Their life turned upside down by Jesus and you're willing to sacrifice your life for Jesus. So therefore to say you tried Jesus is false. You tried him. Like try eating an onion, which I don't like. I've tried onions. I don't like onions. I don't try Jesus. I came to the point in my life where I knew the truth of Jesus is he's the Messiah. And that is what this whole gospel is written about. Is that you may know and believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And by believing in him, have abundant life through him. That's what this whole gospel is about. Everything. Judas was never sold out for Christ, and therefore he became a sellout for Christ. So I ask yourself, ask yourself, am I sold out or am I a sellout? That's the question. Because the thing is, when you're sold out and you give your life over to God and you, you live your life for God, Jesus refers to this. I didn't put it up there. It's my fault because I did the, the thing this morning. But in verse 7 it says, let her alone that she may keep it for the day of my burial. For you always have the poor with me, but you don't have me with, all, with you also. Jesus says, I'm about to go. He tells, he tells Judas, leave her alone. She's doing a good thing. But the biggest thing is because she was sold out for him, she is now enshrined in the gospel for showing what it means to truly have an extravagant love for your Savior. That one verse. Now, she's mentioned multiple other times, but that one verse shows what we as Christians should be when it comes to our Savior. I ask you this morning, where is your relationship with him? Are you truly living for him? If you're claiming to be a, a Christian, a disciple, you know, I've, I've mentioned that many, many times in the time that I've been here as your pastor. There is a difference in claiming to be a Christian and being a disciple. A Christian is one who claims to follow Jesus. A disciple follows Jesus. There is a difference. A disciple is one who takes the teachings of their leader, their teacher, and their master, and they put it into practice. A Christian is one who says, yes, I'm a Christian, I claim to be a Christian. But we got a lot of claimers that are a lot of pretenders out there that aren't truly followers. So where are you at today? And that's what I ask you. If you have never truly surrendered your life or there is something in your life that is keeping you from having a better relationship with Him. Today is the day to turn it over. Today is the day to lay it down at the altar. Today is the day to nail it to the cross that we celebrated a couple of weeks ago that Jesus rose and conquered death and put to sin on the cross. Are you, a, are you sold out or are you a sellout? That's the question today. We saw the two hearts here. It's your decision. Let's all stand for prayer. Lord God, again, I thank you for this day. Lord, I pray for the hearts of all who are in here, Lord, that we do not get complacent. 
It is easy, Lord, to just relax in your love and not go out and tell others about it. Lord, let us, let us sacrifice ourselves for you. Let us give our lives over to you, Lord, that we may glorify you in any way that we can. Whatever the gifts that you have given us, Lord, let us glorify you with them. If it's a gift of service, if it's a gift of song, whatever the gift we can, Lord, let us give it over to you with all that we have. Lord, I thank you for this day, and I pray for everyone in this room, Lord, that they come to know you personally and know you as their Savior, not as just a historical figure. Lord, I thank you, and I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. I must tell Jesus, we are hymn of invitation today, number 430 in your hymnal. I must tell Jesus all of my trials. I cannot bear these burdens alone. In my distress, he kindly will help me. He ever loves and cares for his own. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus. Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. I must tell Jesus all of my troubles, he is a kind friend. If I but ask him, he will deliver. Make up my troubles quickly and end. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, I cannot bear my burdens alone. I must tell Jesus, I must tell Jesus, Jesus can help me, Jesus alone. Again, I thank everyone for being here today. Just a reminder of a quick VBS uh, meeting next door. Um, if y'all make sure that you're going to volunteer or help with that, to make sure you get next door so we get ready. I uh, heard that uh, because we moved our data, we are going to be the first, I think, in Blount County to do it. So, hey, let's set the, let's set the pace for everybody else. There's a